Speaking on a subject as vast as this and hoping to do justice to it in the space of let us say half an hour or forty-five minutes is really crying for the moon. But I shall try to do my best. The subject naturally divides itself into four parts analytically, so that I can tell you what I am about to divulge in these next 45 minutes. First part would really deal with what exactly was the state of religion and philosophy at the time of Zoroaster's birth, which gives you some idea of the background in which he spoke. The next would be what was the radical difference that Zoroaster made by his teaching? The third would then be what did the followers of Zoroaster do to that teaching? Did they follow it in letter and spirit or did they really digress? And fourth, finally, what exactly is the practice of Zoroastrianism as we see among the Parsis of India today? This broadly are the four areas. There's a lot to cover and I hope to do it as best as possible. Starting with the beginning, it might interest all of you to know that Zoroaster describes himself in the Gathas, because the I must give you a little background here. The Gathas are 17 chapters of a book, a holy book, called the Yajashni Ba Niran which consists of 72 chapters. It's a compilation down the ages in Avesta. Again, one must explain what is Avesta. Now, Avesta is an exact sister of Rigvedic Sanskrit. It will interest you to know. And it is thanks to Rigvedic Sanskrit today that we are able to know thousands of years after what exactly our prophet said. I think we are in today a much better position, paradoxically, to know what exactly he said than, say, any of our forefathers for the last 3,000 years. It's a remarkable thing. The Rigved, as you know, is a compilation of some thousand odd hymns. It's a thousand and seventeen hymns, spread over ten books. It's a massive and uh, very, very interesting series of books. Perhaps, arguably, the oldest extant verses that mankind has from the beginning of time. Uh, our peoples, that is, the people who formed Zoroaster's people and the peoples of India really come from a common Aryan stock. The Avestan texts call it Aryanam Vaijo, which is the home of the Aryans. This home, according to Bal Gangadhar Tilak, uh, existed in 10,000 BC, if his dating is correct, somewhere near the North Pole. The North Pole at that time, this was pre-Ice Age, being a place which was apparently readily inhabitable. It's only after the Ice Age that migrations took place and a whole lot of people came down to the steppes in Central Asia from which further migrations took place. They went southwards into the plains of India, they went southwestwards into Persia, and they went westwards, which is why the languages that we speak today in each of these regions are all derivatives of a language which scholars have reconstructed, namely the mother of Rigvedic San Sanskrit, which they call Proto-Indo-European. So all of us are descended from this one particular language and we are the Indo-European family, so to speak. Now, the Rig Ved, I must give you a little background about the Rig Ved, though it's not strictly uh, necessary, but it will give you some idea of the state of religion and philosophy, as I said, at the time of Zoroaster's birth. Uh, that was, according to the Greeks, in 500 BC, 6,000 years before them. So if you have to believe them, 
it was anywhere say between 6000 and 6500 bc other scholars have put it as early as 500 bc which is a theory which is now exploded because they confused a particular person uh, who really belonged to a different dynasty altogether as the father of somebody else not necessary to go into all this but one can safely say that his existence would perhaps be anywhere before 2500 bc anywhere before he describes himself as a zota it's a word familiar with all of you so zota and agni hotri a vedic priest and the revelation that he receives from one creator god he tells us is the first ever time that that god has chosen to reveal himself he says so in so many words now going back a little what was the state in which zoroaster found himself namely the state of the rigvedic religion so to speak spread over the books you find there are basically nature divinities you have divinities fundamentally like fire water the sky the thunder cloud etc all made it to divinities you also have the ethical divinities so to speak varun and mitra who have to uphold the ethical or cosmic law written in the rigved varun being associated with the water odin and mitra with the fire odin and of course you then have and i must i might tell you all these were called asuras at that point of time now the word asura is today synonymous with a rakshas to most of you in those days asura meant a lord it was an appellation for somebody that you looked up to and both varun and mitra were called asur varun and asur mitra you have of course the remarkably colorful personality of indra the king of the gods pervading the rigved you have his remarkable birth his father was supposed to have been vashtar his mother aditi and the great thing that indra did for which he was never forgotten was to reduce the demon of drought to death he was called vritrahan and this he did with the help of his famous vajra or thunderbolt vritra of course was a person who was drunk most of the time he was drunk on a liquid called soma he was horribly profligate in short he was a person who paid very scant regard to ethics and it is his remarkable rise in the rigved which is coterminous with the fall of the ethic god varun and mitra along with all this of course you have in book 10 some very interesting theories of creation now all this is necessary because this is in stark contrast to the revelation that zoroaster comes out you have in book 10 and there are a number of sages speaking right through the rigved so it's not as if there is one mind that is applied there are millions of minds each of which has gone into these remarkable things and come out with his own version of what they are the famous purush shukta him most of you must be familiar with where you have cosmic man called purush who is sacrificed and it is out of that sacrifice that the entire creation of the earth takes place and the famous passage where of course the brahmins come out of the head the kshatriyas from the shoulders etc so you have that as one theory of creation you have as a second theory of creation all in book 10 uh, the concept of prajapati and hiranya garbha now prajapati is the lord of the creatures properly so to speak he creates hiranyagarbha which is 
the cosmic egg, so to speak, where there is an egg which is broken into two parts, consists of the earth below, the sky above and the sun in between. It's another theory of creation. You have a third theory of creation where Vishwakarma, who is the great architect of the universe, stands on a stool like a carpenter and fashions the universe from out of matter which eternally exists. You then have the famous hymn 129. Now 129 is a very interesting hymn because for the first time it speaks of the concept of Swayambhu, somebody who is self-existent. It tells you that existence came out of non-existence. It also tells you that, that Swayambhu existed by itself and breathed by itself. It then goes on to speak of the gods who are much later in point of time in creation. And then ends with a very enigmatic note. It says perhaps the gods in heaven know who created us and where we came from. Or perhaps they know not. And on this enigmatic note, after a few other hymns, the Rig now this is the background in which the prophet Zoroaster comes in as a Vedic fire priest. What then was the great revelation or change that he made? He announced for the first time that there is one creator God and he called him Ahura Mazda. Now Ahura is the equivalent of Asura. It means exactly the same thing. It means Lord. In those days it meant a Lord. Mazda was a newly coined word, which meant two things. Maz, majestic, grand, big, and the creator. So the Lord who is the great creator. So the first important thing that he said was, there is only one God. That one God is self-existent and is the creator of everybody and everything. That's the first great advance in civilization that this man made. The second very important thing that he told us was that this God has actually come down to me on earth and has told me to tell mankind for the first time as to what is the purpose of existence and where exactly we are going to live. So you have for the first time a coherent ethical and metaphysical system given to you. Now what is this ethical system and metaphysical system in that order? The ethical system is very beautifully explained by him in two public sermons that he delivers in the Gathas, which I mentioned to you earlier, which are part of this Yajashni book. They consist of about 220 odd hymns, which are his original sayings. In the public sermons he tells us that the Lord created two spirits at the beginning of time. Now the word for spirit is mainyo. So immediately the word man comes to, to mind. Spirit in the sense of a mental thought process. So he said there were these two spirits created at the beginning of time. What is interesting is he says they were twins. That is, they were exactly alike in every way. The only thing that they were given by Almighty God, which again was common to both, was choice. One chose a right, one did not choose a right. And the allegory, therefore, is to tell all of you that each one of us really contains within us one or the other spirit. And the idea is to choose our right in order to attain the self. Because what is very important in this religion is that you attain the self by the seeming opposite, namely by being selfless. You destroy the self, on the other hand, by being selfish or self-centered. 
a very basic message that he gave. A very, very basic thing to his religion was the old concept of Ritta. In Avesta it is Eretta and the derivative final is Asha. We will deal with the word Asha because it is central to his ethical scheme. Simply translated it means truth. According to him therefore, each one of us is to tread this path of truth. He calls it a path. In fact, the colophon, the last end of the 72 chapters, states a very noble truth in one very simple sentence. It says, there is no path other than the path of Asha, all others are false paths. This is very basic to Zoroastrian belief. The lie is considered the single worst thing in Zoroastrianism. So, because apart from the fact that it is something intrinsically bad, it is also something unreal. The truth alone is real. The lie is parasitic. It is unreal. So he tells you, you are to utilize your conscience, you are all familiar with the word Shruti, to hear from within. He uses the same word, Surush, or Sarosh as it becomes later. You have to utilize the conscience faculty given to you by Aura Mazda. Tread this path of Asha, down which you will get better and better in discernment, in wisdom. Of course, he keeps telling you to be humble, very important in his scheme of things to be humble. The word used is Nemanna. And he tells you that ultimately at the end of life, you will judge yourself. What is very interesting in this scheme of things is that you are going to judge yourself on a playback of your entire life after you die. Your soul, which is called Urva in Zoroastrianism, which comes from the root Ravan, or to choose, the choice faculty given to all of us. Your Urva is nothing but the mind removed from the physical brain. It will determine its next existence, dependent solely upon what it has sown, because it must reap what it has sown. And the general idea is that heaven and hell in Zoroastrianism, described as Garo Deman and Dujya Deman respectively, Garo comes from the same root, Gujarati Gavan to sing, the abode of song as opposed to the abode which is unreal, through is the lie, something unreal. Because it will never exist forever. You are told that you will choose your own next existence dependent on what you have done here. And the idea of hell, so to speak, or the idea of going to an unreal existence is twofold here, and this is important. One is that as you sow, so shall you reap. You must be punished for what you have done wrong. The other is that it must make you try and reform yourself. The idea is there must be that much suffering put on you that ultimately you repent and choose a right. Because God wants none of his children to go astray. Finally, of course, you have the concept of one judgment day at the end of time where every soul, including Hitler, Stalin, Mao and the likes, <laughs> will all pass through a test of molten metal. They will ultimately have to purge themselves of whatever evil. And finally, there is a resurrection of all human beings back here on earth. Now, this is the metaphysical concept that he gives you for the first time. What is very interesting is, this is this religion, really, forms the bridge between Aryan Hinduism and the Semitic faiths. Because ours and our prophet were steeped in the Aryan law. He was an Aryan, like the rest of us. And all the basic truths of revealed religions that he came out with were adopted in Judaism 
that was only after the Babylonian captivity, which I'll come to in a, in a little time. Then through Judaism, through Christianity, and then into Islam, the three great world religions that we have today, which, may, which one could refer to perhaps as the revealed religions, because each one of them says, there is a revelation from God on high to one prophet, and he tells us what is otherwise hidden from us. Now, the whole idea of this entire exercise, so to speak, of creation, leading up ultimately to the resurrection, is that the Lord has created us creatures of will. The Lord did not wish to create us as puppets. Now, we are wills with small means of knowledge. We are nowhere near being omniscient. Because if we were to know, we would necessarily choose the right. Even in ignorance go hand in hand in Zoroastrianism. Hence the importance of telling us now where we are going to go so that we choose the right. We are told explicitly that death of every mortal here is necessary. Why is it necessary? It is necessary because in the world as it exists today, peaceful coexistence is not possible. The entire goal of life, according to Zoroaster, was that each one of us mature and ultimately choose a right for ourselves without being trampled upon by anybody. Each one of us must see the light for ourselves. It is only then that ultimately we are fit for peaceful coexistence. And it is only when that takes place, which is after Judgment Day in the Resurrection, that finally we can all have death removed. So the two concepts here are what he calls U Urvatat and Ameritat. Urva, I have already told you, means your own soul, your, the faculty which thinks. Who, simply speaking, is good. That is a soul which has chosen correctly, has become good, is able to peacefully coexist. Tat is existence. And Ameritat explains itself. Death will be removed. This, in short, I hope I have done justice to this scheme within the space of five or ten minutes, is the metaphysical scheme that he gives us in the Vatican. The ethical scheme is better explained if I am able to perhaps translate for you our two most basic prayers. They are uh, like the Lord's Prayer, like the Gayatri Mantra, and first say them and then translate them for you. The Asham Mahu prayer, or the most basic prayer, deals with Asha, or Tooth. I'll say it first in Sanskrit, and then in Avestan, so that you get an idea of how exactly alike the two languages are. Sanskrit goes like this. Asham Basu, Vasistya Masti, Ushta Asti, Ushta Smyay, Syadasai, Vasistya Asha. The Avestan goes, Asham Bahu, Vaishtem asti, Ushta asti, same, Ushta ammai, yad ashay, Vaishtai ashay. Now what does this mean? Simply translated it means, Truth is good, Asha is good, Ashem Bahu. Vaishtem asti, it is best, it's the highest, Vaishtem. Ushta asti, this is the link with happiness, it is happiness. It's a very, very important step forward. Where does truth lead you? Truth alone leads you to happiness. Ushta my happiness comes to him. Yad Ashai, who for the sake of this particular truth, does the highest truth, by So in short, the link is between living in accordance with truth, which alone will lead to happiness, you do truth, or rather you live by the path of truth, because it is intrinsically good in itself, for no other reason. This is the first basic prayer. 
the second basic threat is the Yathavu area or the Ajnav area threat. In Zoroastrianism, really, this is the most cardinal fundamental threat. This naturally divides itself into three parts, and I might ask for your attention. It's, it's a little complex. The first part, and let me say the prayer first and then attempt to translate it for you. Yatha Ahu Vairyo Atha Rapus Asadachi Thacha, the first part. Vangehush Dazda Manangao Shautaranam, which is a key word. Angehush Mazdai, second part. Kshatrem Cha Ahurai Ayin Drigubyo Dadat Vastayam, the last part. Now, the first part is an interplay between two words, an Ahu and a Ratu. And Ahu, as we have already seen, Ahura is a lord. Here, of course, it's a temporal lord. So it says, just as a lord on earth is all powerful, never forget, so is a person who is spiritually inclined, a Ratu. And his power is because he follows the path of Asha, the path of truth. First. Second, he tells you that there are four gifts of the good mind, so to speak, which will come to you, will deal with those gifts. But they come to you only if you do good deeds, shalkanana, in this life, for love of Almighty God. What those gifts are, I will tell you in a minute. And the last part is the essential to, I think, which has been followed by many Parsis, the basic doing of charity, which is that God's own strength will come to you and help you on earth. If you are able to help anybody in need, the concept is a very vast one. A Drigo is a person in need. So the concept of charity. Now we come back to part two and the gifts. What are these gifts of the good mind? Therefore, Tevishi, Utayuiti, Ku Urvatat and Amerita. Tevishi, shortly speaking, only means a certain strength of character which develops when you in fact live along this path of truth. Uta Yuti is very important because it tells you your life takes on a completely different meaning. You are, you are born again, so to speak. And the other two gifts are after you die. Who Urva Tat, which I have already explained to you, your Urva is your soul, the judgment faculty within you. Once it becomes good, it is chosen aright, there will be existence for all time, Tat, and death will be removed. America. Now, having given you these two basic prayers and their translation, I think you have a reasonable account now of the basic metaphysics and ethics of what the Prophet himself laid down, so to speak. One very basic thing that he himself ordained that we follow is that we worship through fire. Now, you must have heard, all of us are castigated or all fire worshippers. Now, we are fire worshippers in the sense that fire is a symbol of truth. Fire is supposed to be, not God on earth, but a symbol of Asha, which is truth. Now, how is it a symbol of truth? There is a basic distinction between Mankind and the rest of creation, the animal creation, the vegetable kingdom, etc. That distinction lies in the fact that we are creatures of conscience. We can choose our right, we can choose wrong. We alone can light a fire, an animal can't light a fire. We alone can kindle it and we alone can put it out. Therefore, symbolically again, when we light it, we are on the path of truth. In Zoroastrianism, a fire is never to be put out. Because when you put it out, you are no better than the animal creation. You are worse. Because you have chosen wrongly. In short, 
your conscience has become so dim that the light has gone out altogether. So, the basic beliefs therefore, namely in one God, in a heaven and a hell as I, I have explained, in fire as a symbol of truth, in what happens to you after you die and the final of course judgment day and resurrection are in a nutshell what this man taught us for the first time. Now after he expires, the religion as he taught it had to spread. The whole concept that you hear of today is of Parsis being persons who cannot convert is only on Indian soil. It was very much a proselytizing religion in its day. And in the Gathas, in fact, he speaks of a Tulanian, that is somebody who is a Mongol of a completely different race, a man called Fryana, who he has converted in the sense of, not doctrinally, but in the sense of a person who has come over to his way of thinking. Unfortunately, we have in younger Zoroastrianism a shift away from this uncompromising monotheism and the picture I have just given you. We have all the old Rigvedic divinities coming back. Now in the form of angels, they are no longer gods. They are called Yazatas. You have Mitra, a very powerful angel who has come back now. You also have Som, because our Som is home. And you have an entire Yast dedicated, a just is a liturgy, dedicated to him, now as an angel. And obviously it was so difficult for the Zoroastrian priests to be able to spread the faith as it was, that the very beginning of the home years is blasphemous. It actually tells us that Auramanta, the Lord himself, bowed down to him, who is a greater divinity, and ask for his blessing. This only shows you how difficult it was at that point of time for the priests to spread the faith without encountering stiff opposition and without bringing all the old gods and goddesses back. So that after the Gathas you have a period called the Yasna of the seven chapters which brings back these divinities. Then of course after the Avestan period, you have a massive lull because this has been a very, very old religion. It has gone through at least three historical empires. According to us, it has gone through four. You had what was called the Peshtaranian dynasty to start with. Not in, not in recorded history, in Persia itself. Then you had the Kayanian dynasty. King Vistas, who was the king that Zarthustra converted to his faith, belonged to this dynasty. Then you had, in recorded history, the Achaemenian dynasty, which some of you must have heard of, King Cyrus the Great, was the founder of that great dynasty. Then you had the Parthian dynasty. That dynasty, of course, lasted for about 250 years, until Alexander came and destroyed it. Then you had the Parthian dynasty from about, say, 330 BC to about 226 AD. It's a very long period, 500 years where nothing much is known, nothing much is recorded, that Iran was Zoroastrian is itself a matter of doubt in that period. The only thing is that the 21 masks or huge books which contain all sorts of subjects, including astrology, medicine, etc., which had been lost and or destroyed because according to us in a drunken fit, Alexander had destroyed a lot of our world. were all attempted to be brought back in their scattered remains and put together again as 21 masks. This was all done at the time of an emperor called Balbosis, Bhatian emperor. It's only from 226 AD till the Arab conquest, which is about 651, 400 years that we have Zoroastrianism as a state religion of the empire, so to speak. It was not thrust down the throats of anybody else. Incidentally, where we are sitting, Punjab, 
which was referred to as Hapta Hindu in our days. The word Hindu is an Western word, doesn't exist in Sanskrit. Hapta Hindu and the Punjab were twice satraps of two different Persian empires. One under Darius the first, Achaemenian, which is around say 400 BC, and the second under Kushu Parvez, which is almost a thousand years after, uh, 800 years after, 400 odd AD. So we are sitting also belong to two Persian empires for short periods of time. If we were to move on now, we come directly to another period, so to speak, the Pahlavi period. You will remember that Avestan, by the time of the Pahlavi period, had already become a dead language, much like Sanskrit had become here. Pahlavi was the spoken language of the Sasanian kings, that is this period of 225 to 651 AD. And this again was a fertile period for creation. There were some very great personages who existed. In particular, one can think of great priests like a man called Adarbad Maraspan, who in fact underwent various ordeals in order to prove the efficacy of the religion. And there were many, many texts which were written in this period. One very interesting development in this period was the creation of a devil. You will find that both in Hinduism and in Gothic Zoroastrianism, there is no devil mentioned. You may have Rakshasis, you may have Asuras, you may have all sorts of things. But you don't have Ishwar's limiting principle. Now, that limiting principle was for the first time created in the younger Zoroastrian period. The devil was now given a primacy which was never the primacy of the Mainyu or the spirit which chose wrong, if you remember. The devil now becomes the very antagonist of God. And suffering and evil are sought to be explained by younger Zoroastrianism as all being the counterproductive works of a devil which existed eternally with God. And ultimately, since the devil is not omniscient and God is, ultimately, with the help of man, that devil will be cast into the abyss forever and finally the resurrection will take place, a very different picture from what was given by the prophet. This is the one interesting development of younger Zoroastrianism, which according to me goes completely away from the prophet's teaching. Uh, another very interesting thing that I might tell you is the effect that the religion is supposed to have had on Judaism. Now, the Jews, as most of you know, believe fundamentally in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, the books given by Prophet Moses. In those books and in the various other books of the Old Testament, until you come to Daniel, which is one of the recent books, you find no mention of an afterlife. You have a place called Sheol, which is some peculiar dark area into which souls go and nothing else is mentioned. It's only after the Babylonian captivity, sometime in 500 BC, that when King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonians and set the Jews free and in fact actively helped them to rebuild Solomon's temple. The wailing wall that you see today is part of that temple. It is because of this period that the Jewish priests actively imbibe the ideas of a heaven, a hell, a judgment day and a resurrection from the Zoroastrian counterparts. So much so that you had two major sects of Jews by the time Jesus Christ came on the scene. One were called the Pharisees or the Parsis, those who took after the Parsis, and the others were called the Sadducees to a person who did not believe in a resurrection. Christ 
himself, interestingly enough, is predicted in our texts. There is an ancient text called, text called the Farvandin Yasht, which is at least a thousand years before he was born. It's an Avestan text. And it says that three persons, three great saviors in the course of time <coughs> will be born, each of them a vir from a virgin, specifically. And Christ is certainly one of them. The Buddha perhaps is the other. The third is of course yet to come. He is supposed to arrive 57 years before the actual countdown to Judgment Day and the Resurrection. Equally interesting for you is the fact that the three wise men spoken of in the Synoptic Gospel were three Zoroastrian priests. They were described as the Magi. A Marcus is a Zoroastrian priest. These three gentlemen, who obviously were steeped in astrology, followed a particular star all the way to Bethlehem, where they found this little child, blessed him, and said that he was one of those young saviors who was born of a virgin, who would in fact be one of the great renovators of this world. Of course, through Christianity, we have 600 or, yes, about 600 years later, a virtual rehash of the teachings of the Jews in the Old Testament and Christ in the Quran. And interestingly enough, in the early surahs of the Quran, the Muslims faced Jerusalem, which was a Jewish practice, and prayed three times a day. It's only after the Hijar, that is, the flight from Mecca to Medina, and then back to Mecca, that Mecca became the place that they had to face, and they had to pray five times a day, which is worse still, because we are enjoined to pray five times a day. Having given you this little background and this influence on the other faiths, let us now try and arrive to the fourth part of my speech. Namely, how did we come here and what exactly have we done in terms of practice? Now, there is a text called the Kisse e Sanjan or the story of Sanjan, a place where we landed in Gujarat. This, of course, was in 1680, so it was long, long after we actually landed. The date of our landing was supposed to have been somewhere in the 770s AD. And it goes like this. It says that after the Battle of Nahavan, which was in 651, when our last Sasanian emperor got defeated by the forces of Khalid Uthman, a few of the faithful went into a place called Kuristan, into the hills, and lived there for a hundred years. From Kuristan they went to Hormuz, which is a port, lived in Hormuz for about fifteen years. From Hormuz they set sail and came to Diu, which is an island off the coast of India. They lived in Diu for seventeen years. They picked up Sanskrit in Diu. They landed in Sanjan in the 770s, AD, when there was a Yadav ruler called Jadirana at the time. And there is of course this great apocryphal story, which most of you must have heard of, of how a bowl of milk was sent. Nothing of this is in recorded history, unfortunately. And the bowl of milk was supposed to signify that there is no place here, we are full. And our chief priest is supposed to have used his brains put in a little sugar and said that we won't disturb things, we'll only sweeten them. This unfortunately is not in recorded history. What is in recorded history on the other hand is that we composed 16 Sanskrit shlokas. And with those 16 shlokas, we attempted to explain who we were and what our religion was to that Yadav ruler. The Yadav ruler got impressed and he allowed us to stay as refugees on five conditions. Not one of those conditions was conversion or had anything to do with conversion. The conditions were reasonably mundane. 
be aware that you won't bear arms. Your women will dress like our women. You will have your marriages after sunset, which was the practice of the time. We will adopt our language, that is the Gujarati language. And we have faithfully stuck to those conditions for about a long period right up till the Emperor Akbar. So you can calculate from 770 odd right till 1570. We were quiet agriculturists doing our thing by ourselves. We had one of course very difficult period when we sided with the local Hindu Raja against a particular Muslim Sultan got almost annihilated and had to run up to a small place called Barot which is uh, off Bombay, it's about three hours from Bombay. I have, I have been there incidentally. And there are six caves which are viewed now, which are all still there, where my ancestors lived in great difficulty. The little Kibla on which our great fire, the Atash Bairam fire, which is still burning in Udwada, is also there. It was kept and preserved there. And this may be a good time to tell you what exactly an Atash Bairam fire is. See, among us, we have three grades of fire. The Dadga fire or the home fire is something which every pious Zoroastrian is supposed to have burning in his home for 24 hours. The Adaryan fire is a fire that is consecrated and is a stage higher. The Atash Bairam fire is a fire which is consecrated from 16 different fires. You in fact begin with the fire of a corpse which is supposed to be the least pure of all fire. You are not even supposed to look at it. It's supposed to be so impure that you only pick it up, play 120 yajasthis over it, so that it comes up to scratch for the next grade. Then you have the next grade, which is a blacksmith, and so on, the various professions are indicated. Until you come to fire number 15, which is the fire of a pious Zoroastrian householder. And fire 16 is very interesting. You cannot consecrate it until you have lightning fire. So fire number 16, you have to wait for lightning to hit some tree somewhere. You have to get that fire and only then is the Atash Bairam consecrated. So it is this Atash Bairam fire which we made, which is called the Irancha, in memory of our former homeland, which we are supposed to have consecrated after landing here, that has been with us throughout our struggle. is a caste one. I mean, you uh, ultimately, there is a decision of the Bombay High Court, which is the famous decision which decides who exactly we are and what we are supposed to be. Now, one of the judges was a Parsi judge, the other was an English judge. The English judge specifically called us a caste and said that because we were Hinduized to the extent now of being a caste, we were hard and fast like any other Brahmin or Kshatriya caste. Nothing could enter, whatever goes out, goes out. And the trouble is, there is a real double jeopardy. And I'll explain what I mean. See, a person who is born of a Parsi father is a Parsi. Naturally, a patrilineal. Now, if the Parsi father has married out, the children can become Parsi. The trouble is the mother is not allowed in. Now, if the mother is not allowed in, the children becoming Parsis in any real or meaningful sense go. Yeah. First, first problem. Second problem. When the Parsi girl marries out, she can't bring up her children as Parsis. Now, very often, if she marries out, the son will not be allowed to be brought up as anything except what the father's faith is. But the daughters very often are allowed to be brought up as Parsis. But there again, until our law is changed, unfortunately this does not obtain here. So that you have this very, very funny now conundrum in the law. You have Parsi Zoroastrian being defined as a person who is born of a Parsi father and who follows the Zoroastrian. Not, not just the latter. <laughs> Anybody can follow the Zoroastrian religion. I can make you a Zoroastrian, straight away, no difficulty. 
But the trouble is to avail of everything in India, you need to have a dual qualification. Outside India, you are all right. Yeah. Uh, you said Zoroastrianism is a fire worshipping religion. No, I didn't say any such thing. This is the general notion. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you didn't say. You know, in Hinduism, all important uh, uh, ceremonies are around the fire, in the fire. Do right. you find any relationship, any significance as to how the you know, uh, the, I tell you, the difference is this. Agni is a divinity in himself, in the Rigved. You see, Agni is worshipped as a god in himself. Fire in Zoroastrianism, as I told you, is not a god at all. There is no god other than Aura Mazda. First important difference. Second important difference. Fire in Zoroastrianism is symbolic alone. It's a symbol of truth. And I tried to explain how it was a symbol of truth by saying that it actually symbolizes a man's conscience. You can light it, you can kindle it, you can put it out, which the other creation cannot. Animal creation, vegetable creation cannot. Uh, well, in a, in, a, in a way, yes. In a way, no. If it feeds on something horrible, Maybe it is or is not, but it certainly pollutes the atmosphere. Now whether it itself is polluted or not is, a, is another difficult question. Any other question? Yes, Professor Jitaraman.
And what is interesting is, with our friend Ronka, he knows so much about the Rig Veda and the Hindu religion, which I confess I didn't know about. He knows a lot about Christianity. Also. Christianity. But I must tell, in, in relation to the question which Professor Sitaraman, out of the suggestion he made about how to increase the numbers, in the Jews' religion, the very first sentence is, multiply. I suppose that could be, <laughs> that could be a suggestion to the Parsi community. Well, at the moment we are dividing, we are not multiplying at all. <laughs> now, I must say one thing. In one of our Upanishads, I think it is a very Upanishad, the concept of truth which he spoke about, the very first verse of that is, Vāngme manasi pratishthita, manome vāt pratishthitam, mā virā vīrma edhi, vedasya mavānesa, shutam me mā prahāsihi, satyam vadishyam, tanmām avatu, tad vaktāram avatu, avatu mām, avatu vaktāram, etc. So the man who, if I must speak the truth, and who God will protect me, in what I speak and protect me when I speak. So satya or truth is a, a, is a concept I think which is common to all religions, whether it originates from um, Rig Veda or anything, is not material. The real thing is that we talk of satya, but our action and our thoughts, they don't go together. Now, I'm sure there are many people who are wanting to ask uh, uh, Rohingtan question. There is no question of time. We have enough time if there is anyone who wants to, to dig into his knowledge, please do that. Uh, Mr. Verma, yes. Actually, kicked the waves 
and this is recorded in history. And the Magian priest told him that this is a bad omen. The water is something that is sacred to Zoroastrians. You are having kicked it is very, very bad and you will therefore suffer. And he, right enough he suffered at Salamis and had to turn back and come back. Thank you. So now at Salamis, the sea battle. Yes. Dramapala we won. Marathon we lost. Mr. P.P. Rao, he wants to ask. You. majority of them happen to live in Bombay. And uh, the problem is, Bombay as you know, housing is a very major difficulty. Parsi daughters-in-law are not Hindu daughters-in-law. They are much more independent. So, you have, until these sort of things are resolved, it becomes very difficult in fact. It's very difficult for persons to crowd into one bedroom. You know, sometimes you have to crowd into one bedroom in, in the moment to procreate. So these are very real problems and until these are really solved, and people are not willing to go into the suburbs, because now you to get a flat in the suburbs again costs beer. And your quality of life becomes miserable, because if you spend two hours up and down or more, traveling into town every day, then... Uh, till now, Pune is supposed to be a suburb. You are right, people travel from Pune to Bombay every day. Yeah. People actually travel from Pune to Bombay every day for work and back. Yeah, right. You see, the idea seems to be that it's a fire. 
Maya that represents uh, virtually everything universally, from the lowest to the highest. So the idea is that you cannot possibly have anything lower than a corpse in the Western world. Well. The moment the spirit leaves the body, the body is uh, a component of evil. I mean, it's something that has to be disposed of immediately. So a fire burning on a corpse is perhaps the single most impure, horrible thing. So from the most horrible to the most sublime and everything in between, that seems to be the idea. The concept is a very simple one. You see, just as an animal is disposed of naturally, ours is a natural process. The only difference is that a human body cannot, like an animal's body, be left to rot somewhere on the street. It must be put into a particular place where ultimately it can be disposed of by nature. Or could it be one more Could it be one more Yes. At least, even when you move there, it is useful for Perhaps yes, perhaps yes. Perhaps yes, that's why I'm saying perhaps yes. Because being destroyed totally, you can help anybody. But then in burial it's useful for worms in that sense. So, I mean, that doesn't really... Yeah. The idea is also not to pollute, you see. Because in younger Zoroastrianism, the earth is considered sacred. Fire is considered sacred, so you don't pollute them by. Yeah. 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 Big problem. Big problem. Yeah. It's a major problem. It is. People are trying to solve it at the moment. In fact, now they have put up uh, massive uh, solar heaters, which now uh, apparently are able to reduce the cops to a cinder in. Three or four days. Yes. Any other question? We have friends with us. Mr. Pali Nariman sitting in a corner quietly, and uh, Mrs. Nariman, that is Dapshi Nariman. I wonder if Pali would like to say a few words before we continue. <laughs> I must tell you, our Mr. Verma is uh, himself, Mr. Achil Verma himself is a historian. He has been writing books relating to uh, several historical aspects. One of them is the decisive battles of India through the ages, and it is in two volumes. This is one of his publications. And he is kind enough to ask me to present this to Sir, may I say how delighted I am and all of us are that our friends in such good number, including persons of great distinction, Fali I mentioned where our friend Mr. Shanti Bhushan present here. I wonder if he has any question or any suggestion to make. The man of great experience, ex-law minister, one of the topmost lawyers in the country. And I wonder, before I conclude, he would like to give us the benefit of some talk.
पार्लियामेंट पेपर ऑफ राज्यसभा से ही क्या और फ्रेंड्स बिफोर वी कंक्लूड में आई रिक्वेस्ट आवर सेक्रेटरी जनरल टू गिव ए वोट ऑफ थैंक्स प्रपोज ए वोट ऑफ थैंक्स मेनी वील एम ऑल ज्वाइन फॉर द डिनर विच इज रेडी है But what I'd like to say uh, very quickly is that what has emerged from today's talk that uh, Zoroastrian religion, of course, is a religion of faith, of optimism, of active virtues, and uh, I think uh, what has emerged is that uh, the teaching of Zoroastra shows that uh, uh, that it is not only a uh, uh, life is not only a blessing, but it is also a duty. It is also a duty. It is also a struggle, and therefore the very essence of the Rastra religion is that uh, one must um, combine the um, uh, active virtues along with hard work and labor. I think this aspect of hard work and labor is very evident from the emergence of men of eminence who, I mean, we've had scholars who've had the national movement. I mean, people like Dada Bai Narayanji, the home of first. We have the best of doctors, and I think uh, one setting, if I'm not mistaken, has been quite a lot with the Russians. Yeah. And we even have surgeons, and we have our teams where we also have uh, doctors. Um, uh, people have risen to such eminence. And as you rightly said, that the word Asha, um, uh, which uh, is basically, I think, the Tasmic uh, word, word, and uh, that is the word for. This is a tradition which combines within itself the qualities of uh, uh, all the virtues and the ethics of Western religion. Uh, but I also like the three aspects that we talked about. We didn't mention the words, but uh, good actions, good deeds, which means uh, what are the words? Yes, because I remember Mr. Raymond mentioning this on television that this is what guides everybody. Yeah. And uh, then we are um, uh, very brilliant uh, comparisons with the, with the Vedic texts. The question of God has these spiritual sounds. I think we need to have it in our religion. Uh, I think friends, uh, there is not much to be said after the month of discourse. We all had a very good report. We all learned a lot about a, a religion which I think most of us were quite ignorant. And I think it has created us an interest to go back and read, and perhaps now understand it more closely. Um, and we just hope and pray. That, as you said, that because of the dwindling numbers, and if I'm not mistaken, the UNESCO had also mentioned that perhaps in 2020 you'll be moving down to 23,000 or something at the rate of growth, which is practically nil. Like, like a zero 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 point something. So, with the result, I think it's high time uh, with a uh, suggestion put forth by one of our senior members that if we could open the doors, <laughs> uh, not only to allow conversion, but to act, accept the daughter in laws who are non Zoroastrians, or the son in laws, and allow it to be a child of one parent who is Zoroastrian to adopt the faith. I think we're long going to preserve this very, very ancient and beautiful culture and religion. And with these words, uh, may I thank everybody present here, especially of course, our speaker today, Jenny uh, Sikha as well. And all the other city members will come in because everybody is doing their own right out here. And we have the president myself, and 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 myself, and